Robert's house was one of a few the volcano spared. And from here, it went out to the ocean. And from there, it went all the way down and took three houses. In total, nearly 200 homes were buried. Carlo Caracci's house amongst them. I felt like, well, you know, I was allowed to live up there for so many years, and now it's time to give something back, all of it back, actually. But like how I say, life must go on. Kalapana has gone forever. It lies 50 feet under a blanket of solid rock. This was once the road to Kalapana. For us, such violent events are catastrophic. But for our Earth, they are no more than the beats of a much greater time scale of change. To understand this, I'm going to take a closer look at the engine that drives this change. Kilauea, the world's most active volcano, has been erupting continuously since 1983. This power isn't only a source of destruction, it's the creator of new land. This is one of the youngest parts of our planet, built from countless layers of solidified lava. Imagine that each of the Hawaiian islands was created in this fashion, volcanoes punching their way to the crust of the earth, forming islands. Island after island after island. This is the origin of the Hawaiian chain, and it's still happening right before our eyes. Over time, this process causes change on a huge scale. This island was created by volcanoes 800,000 years ago, and it's still growing at the rate of about a square mile every 20 years. And you can actually see that process happening right over there. Already 20 miles to the south, 3,000 feet underwater, yet another volcano is being born. Lava is pouring out of the Earth's crust, creating what will be the next Hawaiian island. And in 200,000 years, that could be as big as the island that I'm standing on right now. The creation of the entire chain of Hawaiian islands took 43 million years. But the Earth is a hundred times as old as that. And in that amount of time, our entire planet has been transformed. From the time the Earth cooled, its rocky crust has always been on the move. Oceans and mountain ranges have been and gone. Our planet today is just a snapshot in time. 250 million years ago, the globe was very different. It was time that created the continents we recognize today and time will continue to transform the Earth. But 
time has been crucial to another unique and extraordinary journey. Life. We are part of the most extraordinary story of all, part of the incredible diversity of life on our planet. So, what is our journey through time? What I find remarkable is the fact that this journey is imprinted in me. My body is like a museum. My face, my features, my arms, my legs, all of them bear the scars of evolution. So if I could peer into my DNA, into my body, I could perhaps retrace the steps taken by my ancestors thousands of years ago. I could take my own journey through time. For a start, look at my eye. My eyelid has a fold of skin that covers its inner corner. It's called an epicanthic fold. This is what gives Japanese people and many Asians our distinctive eye shape. This eyelid is part of this museum. This epicanthic fold evolved about 30,000 years ago when the people who now populate Asia were sealed off to the north because of the Ice Age. This fold was actually quite useful. It protected the eye against the blinding blizzards and storms and also the scorching nature of the sun. However, I call it a scar of evolution because I don't need it anymore. After all, I live in downtown Manhattan. I don't live in Asia during the Ice Age. All these marks of time are cataloged in my DNA. It's my ultimate museum, locked in every one of my cells. One part of my DNA, mitochondrial DNA, is the key to tracing my ancestry. This DNA links me to all the mothers of my past. How and when I became a Japanese American living in the 21st century, somehow it's all encoded right here. I'm sending it to a special lab in Cambridge. Geneticist Peter Forster has created a global map of human ancestry, all based on DNA. By checking my sample against his database, I'm hoping that he'll be able to find out where my ancient forebears came from. I've come to London to see what Peter's found. I've been looking forward to this moment. Hi, Richard. Pleased to meet you. I'm Hi. Peter Forster. All oh, right. How do you do? Do you take a seat? Sure. So exciting. So, the moment of truth. What we've done for you is we've determined your mitochondrial DNA sequence. We can then trace your maternal ancestry back through the generations. I see. I think my mother would be delighted to know this, too. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the result we got. Uh -huh. um, your mm -hmm. type your mm -hmm. branch in the mitochondrial DNA tree mm -hmm. of humans is what we call M9. Mm -hmm. And M9 has... Oh, so my lineage has a name. Has a name? <laughs> M9. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing is that in Japan, we only have about three hits mm -hmm. in a sample size of over a 1,000. That's unusual, though, right? Yeah, it's not a very usual lineage, in other mm -hmm. words. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see that you have cousins, distant cousins, uh, quite far away in uh, and around Tibet. Is that right? Your maternal lineage, mm -hmm. M9, has its highest frequency in Tibet of the area studied so far. Wow, that's amazing, huh? <laughs> who, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. So, life's full of surprises. I'm a Japanese-American Tibetan living in New York. In fact, the same DNA connects us all back to the very first modern humans that evolved in Africa over a hundred thousand years ago. But what about before that? One remarkable discovery has revealed our link to life from a much deeper past. 